What changes are needed to transform the education system to support teachers, schools, and families for better outcomes for all children? <coughs> and I'm understanding we are in a, the department, the Victorian government is rolling out a you know, five year reform program with disability inclusion, but there is going to be an again without going how much intel's in the room of your lived experience, mm -hmm. but we need to just give a couple of insights um, very briefly. You heard Karen on the panel this morning about what she was saying about some of those things, so reflect on that. Um, but also reflect on the fact as an organisation, the number of requests we get from families about children with complex behaviour, and that is just not now students with disability, that is students in general, I mean, little children, or children as young as grade two, that can't emotionally regulate. Mm -hmm. And so because of this, their behaviour, then, then what happens, that triggers then schools feel that the parents need to go and get that looked at by health professionals. And then we've got some representation from consulting firms here in the room that work with parents and with um, big families around these kids, be it their neurotypical or whatever's going on in their life, um, trauma, et cetera. Um, but those children sometimes are asked, some of the parents quite willingly withdraw them from school until the school has the capacity or resources to bring them back. That's not okay you know, because those kids are out too. But we, under, we acknowledge and empathise with the staff and schools that they're in a rock and hard place because they may not necessarily have the access to talk, the sports resources to do what they need to do. And that, on top of that, is compounding the workforce shortages. And this is why a lot of people are leaving teaching because they're feeling that they're hamstrung. So if we started with initial teacher education, yeah. uh, particularly on how to build relationships and to understand that uh, content perhaps isn't the most important thing that you're going to teach children yeah. is. Um, and that it's important to realise that you're teaching children content, not just teaching content. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> And when it comes to disability, uh, yes, content is going to be there, but you are working with children, you are working with families, you are working with colleagues. So we had that at the initial teacher education stage with how to build relationships and to realise that teaching is more than just content, to know about trauma, disability, sensory impacts, and the list just goes on. Um, we had the, the importance of it not just being optional to build relationships with the family because some schools have it ingrained and some schools are very nice. Um, <coughs> with the student and with colleagues and the collaboration is uh, important to the success of all of that. Uh, space and resources to enable inclusion. Uh, like consulting with families about particular needs and the best ways to achieve personal development, and then that has to be revisited. It's not a one-off. Uh, consistent access to specialist resources and appropriate models for building appropriate school spaces and to be able to clean them. Um, a lot of our conversation was around um, disabilities being identified at the kinder stage and a good handover from school to a kinder to school so that the school knows you know, what the child's disabilities are and yeah, the identification there. Um, lack of training, you know, one afternoon every five years is not gonna um, train teachers in disability. Um, sometimes it's not the school not wanting kids with disabilities there, it's the other families. They feel that you know, if there's a child with a disability in the class, the teacher's attention is always with that child mm -hmm. and that their child is going to miss out if they're not, um, yeah, if the mm -hmm. child is monopolising the teacher's attention. Uh, yeah, PV, have, um, as long as I've been involved with them, we've had a, a policy around inclusive education, so that's not going to change. Um, oh, and I was just having a bit of a Google while we were talking. Uh, talking about allowing kids with disabilities to right. develop their strengths, not always looking at, they can't do this, they can't do that, but yeah. Do you want to add anything, Marissa? There you go. 
Where are we sure? Yeah, you go for it. Um, we talked <coughs> about parent engagement being essential um, and making sure that there is a partnership approach and talking through what the best solutions are for the child at the centre. Um, and of course, initial teacher education and teacher training in understanding um, children's cognitive abilities and where they need support with their cognitive skills for learning. Uh, we also talked about, um, I guess we, we discussed a lot about neurodivergent children and, and the fact that they have different, uh, well, all children have different needs in terms of their feelings and how feelings are connected to learning and how some children are more sensitive in you know, certain environments. So uh, really, uh, being a, teachers being aware and having the skills to have that emotional intelligence to be aware of what each child's needs are. And it's a challenge, I know, for teachers to be able to support every single child in the classroom. However, a teacher who knows their children, their students, um, is able to cater for those needs, but also that parent engagement aspect of uh, tapping into parent knowledge about their child as well, who you know them best. Uh, so we talked about a few things. Um, one of them was about the possibility of increasing the workforce of Triple S, so the student support service team, because they're the ones that can go out into the schools, they can support them and educate them around what it means to make reasonable adjustments for students in classrooms and the yards. Um, and it's really putting in that early intervention and primary prevention approach as well, which is what we really need to be doing because we don't want to be waiting until things are diabolical and everything's gone wrong and students are being like, pulled out of the school and kept at home. Because that's not fair, they need the education as well. So I think increasing that triplets um, workforce would be helpful in that way. They would also be able to educate us around trauma and the impacts um, of all of this work as well. Um, we also talked about a DI, well, what we could call a DI passport. Once it's been through the process, then it's done. And we don't need to do it again. Yes. That, that would be great because it, there's so much work that's involved in it. Um, I, my view is that if they have qualified for disability inclusion, then why, when we do a six annum review, why are we needing to do that? Yeah. Because that, the disability is not going to go away. The disability will, will probably remain there for a while. And when they go to high school, it's actually going to be worse. Yeah. Because there are so many other things that they've got to experience as they go to high school. Um, we talked a bit about NDIS, so if they qualify for NDIS, why is there even a question about needing to go through the process of DI? Why can't they just be? That's right, why can't it be replicated? Um, and the benefits we, really the benefits were around that primary prevention, the early intervention, and greater levels of service, which is what they'll receive if we're able to do these things. And reduction of work, but break people work in our schools. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, funding and resources, like, seems like a very simple answer, but it's the most obvious and potentially one of the most areas. So, funding, we spoke about for individual students, but also for support staff and, and you know, all of the resources that we need. Um, education and support for staff who are working with students is going to be another one of the biggest things. If staff don't know how to approach these situations, how to help these students, and then it's just never going to happen. Um, another one, have conversations. That's a change that needs to happen with everybody who's involved, but I think particularly with the student. Mm -hmm. student is involved, talk with them, not just over them or scout them. Mm -hmm. um, and those students will quite often know better than anybody else involved in what they think mm -hmm. and how that can help them best. Yeah. Um, we're also thinking a little bit that's out. Like I very much agree with early intervention being a huge part that needs to come into this and having <coughs> strength based learning. We know just strength based approach works in all aspects of helping people with disability. And so that needs to come into education. So I'm going to things, but I think education is for the start is kind of the largest one that we get coming back to. Um, our table, um, you just or your tail is allowing us on one of our problems. So we're as strong as around 
the students in waiting, funding assessments, and the allocation of resources. Um, we, the solution is that an interim funding allowance at the prep level until that money comes in. They get back paid, but they need the support and work ahead. So the students are not already behind before they start. Um, students with complex behaviour, a care support team um, in the interim and <coughs> the student and staff have received the training in a support say needs to get things back mm. on an even field. And they could be a whole range of different support services. Something we've heard from John today about, you know, because when sometimes it's complex behaviour, it's just that the student does not trust the adults in, in, in the space. Um, the next one was around the administrative burden of any new reform. So we were talking about this, the early reforms have been rolled out for over so many years in our state school system. Um, and, and if you know, the ones that's been reported back to us about the student profile, the new process that they do, um, that they're still adding workload to the workforce. 